Hello, K-12 online viewers and listeners. Thanks for dropping into my video. Uh, this video is all about Steam Maker, STEM, Steam, and Maker education. This is aimed at beginners, why and how beginners might start. If you're an advanced maker, good for you. Go get them. But nobody, if nobody's following you with what you're doing and, and, and your school and you're, you're by yourself and people think you're just that weirdo tinkering around in the other room, you might want to share this video with your colleagues. We're going to talk about bridging traditional STEM to phenomenal maker spaces. I'm Ginger Lumen. I like to work with reluctant teachers. Reluctant teachers, they want to do the right thing. I do believe that. They have heart, they have passion, but they deserve to know how and why things are going to work for them and for their students. So that's what I like to do. I like to work with those teachers. So let's, let's jump on in. I've been working with STEM since back in 2004, trying to convince legislators to create advanced programs for gifted learners. Uh, this was done back in the depth of No Child Left Behind, and, and, and we've built our STEM programs there originally. And they start a lot and continue on with what, I, I don't know, I'm calling them um, our teddy bear projects. They're soft, they're cuddly, they're familiar, they're friendly. Uh, things like uh, spaghetti bridges that... <laughs> I, don't, I, like, I look at that picture and think eh, there's maybe some low-level engineering going on there. But uh, spaghetti bridges is something that we do on a regular basis. Egg drops, they're lovely, they're fun, intentional, uh, mathematics, uh, the learning that's happening there. Yes, great teachers do put a lot of that intentionality and mathematics into it, but I think that too many teachers don't necessarily. I think maybe they do egg drops as kind of a culminating fun project and move it on and they call it STEM and it's not so much. I've seen even biology teachers uh, work with animal adaptations and do things like uh, paper mache and uh, is it, are they teaching anatomy? Is, are they just doing it to bring in art? Is it engineering? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure and, and they do it at, at, at various levels of success. And, of course, our more recent uh, favorite teddy bear project is, is our bungee Barbie. I don't, I don't, I don't know, there's some worksheets here. I, I, we can do STEM with worksheets, and, and I get why we do that. I mean, it's about reflection. It's about making sure to have that rigor in there that maybe that egg drop doesn't have. And it's okay. I mean, it's better than just tossing the Barbie over the edge and saying, yay. Um, but I wonder if worksheets... I wonder if they really truly engage. I wonder if if that's what we're really trying to do. I mean, bless our souls, we're trying, aren't we? Um, many of our teachers in our schools have, have started to move or have already moved from STEM to STEAM to add in the arts. But but what if what if what if we rethink technology and instead of saying technology, because technology is everywhere, it's like making the T thinking or something, right? What if we changed it to tinkering? I mean, I, I pictured Geppetto in his workshop building things, a little old man in his garage inventing the neatest, coolest, next. What if we ask kids to tinker, right? What's the value there? What if instead of saying arts and thinking uh, paper mache or, 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 or um, crayons or, or paint or sculpting, what if instead we went with aesthetics? Because even an engine or the internals of a wind turbine can be beautiful, right? I mean, why not? In adding tinkering and aesthetics, I think we start moving into that engineering field a little bit better. And the world is going to be getting a whole lot cooler once we start moving toward that maker movement. A lot of people I talk with are saying they're not sure what the maker movement is. Let me show you a little video. I'm Eric Radner. And I'm Brent Bushnell, co-founders of 2-Bit Circus. And this is our Los Angeles workshop. We've set out to reimagine the carnival, the carnival of the future. The Steam Carnival is a modern traveling circus featuring high-tech games built with lasers, robots, and fire. It'll open in Los Angeles and travel to San Francisco next spring. We've already made a lot of fun games to inspire kids to pursue science, technology, engineering, art, and math, or STEAM. 
We're raising money to finalize production, to secure locations, and to reach out to schools. Inventing new carnival games, coordinating mentors, and organizing a full road-ready carnival takes resources. We've got great ways for the whole family to get involved, including special kits that kids can use to make their own futuristic entertainment and be part of the show. With the help of the community, we want to engage, entertain, and educate young minds all across the country. Tell all your friends. Support the STEAM Carnival today. Thank you, and we'll see you at the STEAM Carnival. Okay, how many of us look at that and think, oh my gosh, how cool is that? And how many of us know that we're going to have administrators or school board members or somebody who's going to say, what? Open flow? No way, no way. And uh, I mean, that's that's what the modern make and maker movement is. It's just really, it's it's very cool, very interesting. By the way, drop into that YouTube link that I've got down there in the bottom and, 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 and take a look at that video a little bit slower if you want to. But the modern maker movement is about getting back into hands-on building and developing persistence and grit. Not only the grit for stick to right? But also literally grit under our nails. And gosh, don't our kids need that? There's all sorts of affordable and maybe not so affordable hardware to get started. Um, I'm going to let you go ahead and pause. Take a moment here. Uh, Google these terms. Check out their intro videos to each one of these and, and tell me if these aren't going to hook your kids. Absolutely, right? One of the best resources, if you're interested in going in this direction, one of the best resources out there is a book called Invent to Learn with uh, Sylvia Martinez, Gary Steger writing this. Their research is impeccable with this. Their ideas are solid. My, uh, my colleague, Kevin Honeycutt, and I, uh, when, we first, uh, when they first came out with this book, we dove right into it and were so excited. We immediately saw the work that he and I had been doing for the past 10 years and the research that backed it up. So anybody asks, well, what? what this maker space. What's the research behind it? Man, you better have this book at your fingertips. So if we have STEM and STEAM and we try to combine it with the maker movement, the, the, uh, the old school No Child Left Behind era STEM with the hot new concepts of, of today, maker space, that's, that's what I do. I combine these to where we can see how they come together and let's, let's smash that stuff together to make what, uh, what we're calling STEAM maker. It's a combination. It's a way for teachers who have trouble bridging that, that hot makerspace area to see possibilities. But right now, what I'm seeing is there's a gap. There's a gap that we're facing in innovation when we've got traditional teachers on one side and innovative jumpers on the right. Yeah? And, and the innovation teachers say, jump! jump, jump, and, and, and the traditional, more traditional-minded teachers, man, they want to, they want to. And and when the gaps were shorter and closer together, it's easy to make that hop, right? But each year, that gap continues to widen. With each new innovation, with each new tool, with each new concept, with a new thought, it widens even further. And so the innovative teachers are yelling, jump, jump. And again, they want to do the right thing for their kids. They get excited. And when they jump, it's not always successful. They can't do it alone. And they feel they can't, and so they don't even try. And then we blame them. We could go ahead and blame them, or we could build bridges. I love building bridges. I did it for PBL, and now we have what I think really is the great the steam maker bridge between the STEM classroom and maker education. See, I think steam maker moves us from the NCL, NCLB style STEM into more engagement, so teachers and students can find their way toward a more pure makerspace mentality. So let's, let's jump right in. Our Steam Maker Camp's a five-day camp. <laughs> it's 14-hour days. Now, this is because it was in the summer. It doesn't have to be that long all the time, but I wanted them, the, both the teachers and the students, to really get submersed in the process so where they would be almost forced to hit a wall and then see their way through that. And yes, it's students and teachers coming together to learn. It's set for grades five through eight. Now I am working on a, a steam maker junior for the littles, right? To see how, and if anybody's working on that area right now for littles, I definitely would love to talk with you about that. But it's about, again, merging that STEM and maker ed. Our main goals, it's really about helping teachers see how to do the right thing. I really believe that teachers teach how they're taught. 
if we want lecture and teacher controlled learning, <laughs> we should just run our pre service and professional learning that way. But if we want authentic learning, right? If we want teachers to learn how to let go of the reins, we have to role model in how they're learning. I want kids to know that learning's fun and that they can do things without that permission to pee mentality that we forced on them. It's about them learning to know how to take charge. They can what? They can learn, have fun, grow, fix it, do it. Absolutely, all of the above and more. See, Steemaker brings kids and teachers together as true co-learners and collaborators and exchange mentors. If we want teachers to do good teaching and learning every day, they have to experience it as learners themselves. And they've got to do it with real kids in a real learning environment. <laughs> when I first thought of building this bridge between STEM and, and Maker Ed, I had no idea how to do it. And it's happening now, it's happening. So let's talk details. In five days, strangers came together with a stranger, that's me. Uh, we had to start really small and we had to build a vision of possible, but I had to, to build it and plan big because I didn't know who was coming to the table. I didn't know what their skills were. I'm gonna guess that a lot of them didn't have a lot of practice in thinking and learning this way, but you never know who's gonna jump in and go fast and, and, and really devour all you have planned. So I planned way bigger than I thought they would ever go. These are our basic modules that we had. I hate that term, modules. I don't like stations either. I, if you guys can think of a better, better term, please shoot that my way. But uh, these are the things, these are the locations, uh, modules, because that's what I'm going to call it, uh, where we had kids diving in, learning, and, and, and playing. So let's dive in now. What are the modules that we worked with? Fabrics and wearable technology. Had it set up at tables where the kids got a little introduction of what might be there. Every group experienced every single module. And they got a quick taste. They got two, three hours to, to work there. And you, they, as they go there, they run across this, which you see on your screen right now, is a table tent. And they all had to learn very basic skills. Here's, here's the thing, though. Every single kid wanted to learn how to sew. Not because, here, we're going to learn this stitch and then that stitch. And here's the basics of the machine and let's die. I didn't do that. I said, well, let's make a backpack. How about a gadget bag? Something that you can that you can wear to hold your phone or your or your, or your fire, or your Kindle Fire, or, or whatever. And uh, that's what they wanted to do, and so had to learn how to sew in order to build those. Uh, you'll see on there the Sewing Nerd on YouTube. I put together a playlist. Uh, she is a great person to watch. She makes sewing cool and fun. I will give you a warning though. She does have kind of a, a beverage, a beer, or a drink with each, each uh, particular thing she sews, almost every single one of them. Uh, you should preview her videos before you put it on your playlist. Uh, I did edit out, not edit the video, but I did not put everything that I wanted to on this playlist. But that being said, I talked to the kids and said, hey, you know, this is what she does. We're not caring about that. We're moving forward. You got to do what your uh, community will allow. Your mileage may vary. Do the right thing for your kids in your community. But then you'll see, once they've got the basics, now the level one challenge is to build something they're proud of. That's, that's their push through. That's where they're going. Now, eventually we'll get to the level two challenges, but this is just kind of the introduction. Again, two, three hours per module. Let's take a look at what Anna had to say. And Anna's kind of quiet, so um, listen carefully, and you might want to turn your sound completely up. Inside, which I think is so cute. This took me about 46 hours to make, but I think it's worth it because it's the cutest pie I've ever made. First, what we had to do is we had to 
Now, you see her pause there because she remembered. What she's in right now is we set up a little, um, those of you who remember those reality shows where they have the confessional booth. I didn't want to call it a confessional booth. We called it a self-interview booth. And we set up an iPad on a... uh, uh, music stand with really strong Velcro, and uh, the kids walked up and they just pushed record. And when they were finished, and I rec- uh, they pushed stop, and I encouraged them to uh, make thirty second videos or shorter. I wanted them very short, and so you can see she's getting ready to make a, a second video to kind of tell how she did the thing. But look at her, look at her face. She's so excited. She worked four to six, not forty six, four to six hours on this. Um, Over to the right, you see her taking it to the next level. This is part of her level two challenge where she has mashed up um, sewing, which she had never done before, and then made a headband. And she's mashing it up with a different module, which you'll see here in a second, where she would be bringing in technology. Now, because this was only a uh, a five-day camp, we weren't able to go as far as we wanted to. Imagine if this was a year-round curriculum. Headbands, nothing. What she tells it is, is this is a headband for people who are going through chemotherapy. And given more time, she wants to develop uh, a temperature sensor so it can give her an alert as uh, whoever is going through chemotherapy, uh, have an alert. Are their temperature too high? Is it too low? How are they feeling? And and just so they're aware of self-diagnostics. Additionally, something she was really in love with was the idea of aromatherapy. You push a button or two, and depending on how you're feeling, it uh, dispenses certain scents to help you feel better, whether it's nauseous or you can't sleep or, or you're too sleepy sort of thing. So we need a little perk up. She was really excited about that. She had a list of about 10 different things that this headband would be able to do once she was able to dive in and start playing with the technology. Possibilities are endless, y'all. Let's take a quick listen to Marshall, who had about two hours to work on lyrics, learn software, and practice, record, and revise. Oh, well, apparently we're not going to listen to Marshall. (laughs) There we go. If you want to mess with technology and change the world, Steam Mix is the place to go, yeah? Ginger by my side, helping me gang up on problems and figure it out. Check the list and here's the order it goes in. Ching! Hey, what's the problem? Let's go ahead and brainstorm. Test, 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 fail. Evaluate. And try, try again. Present and publish. And watch everyone publish. Hey, come on down. Let's go. Let's go make the world a better, a better place. Now, Marshall's a seventh grader who learned the software and had never done anything like this ever before in his life. Imagine if he had maybe a year-round program where he could really dive in and, and get better. So in the music producer module... They really were given a choice of whether they could build instruments or just make music. Some kids kind of dabbled in both, but we asked them to go one way or another. So in their two to three hours, they could really dig in a little bit deeper. Remember, on these tents, we're seeing the basic level one and two. Each group gets about that, like I said, three hours. Level two is where we're aiming for, and you'll see those in a minute. These are two girls who learned the structure of music and storytelling. If you've ever had kids work with GarageBand or any other looping uh, software, they just smash a bunch of cool loops together and call it a song, and it's not a song. So once they've done that, then I ask them to listen to a song that they know and that they like, and then look for and listen for repeats and for some continuity and see if it just has any similarities to what they put together. And through that discovery process, I can predict where they're going to make mistakes, and I let them make those mistakes and continue to revise them. Girls did a great job with their music, too. I'd love to share it, but just let me know if if, if you want to hear some more of these examples. One of the more popular modules we had was our robotics. Again, kids had all sorts of choices of whether they wanted to code and redesign a strand beast or if they wanted to do building and programming. Um, 
what we have here is most kids chose to go with working with the Hummingbird Robot Kit. And we'll, we'll look at some examples. I do want to let you know that QR code would send will send you to my YouTube playlist of Teo Jansen's Strand, Strand Beast, which is a wind-powered robot that's... Uh, was giving kids the option to learn how to design these creatures who walk on their own in the wind. If you haven't had a chance, if you're not familiar with the Strong Beast, you have to check that out. As I said, most of our kids went and decided to design, build, and program with the Hummingbird Robotics. It's a great program, great tool. Um, these guys, these, this group that you see right here made a lion because their mascot at their school is a lion, and it roared, and it responded to questions you would ask. Um, another team made a monkey. My little fourth and fifth grade students made a monkey. There was a duck that quacked and moved and flapped its wings and its eyes glowed red. And then another group made a baby who cried, cooed, and shake, shook a rattle. This is not uh, something that comes with the Hummingbird Robotics. The kit, the electronics do, but you make it do what you want it to. And it really expands up. The kids use the visual programming model. Pretty quick plug and play. Took them about four hours to get one going. But uh, the actual thing itself that you are designing is all your own. Circuitry is a, is a module that, that holds a lot of the hardware that we see in a lot of maker spaces because they're affordable, it's fun, it's flexible. Again, I want kids to know how these things work. If you're working with Makey Makey or Little Bits, don't just put these things together and say, ah, it's cool. How does the circuitry work? Why does it work that way? And you'll see on my level one challenge there, uh, they could choose between the challenge A or challenge B. I wanted them to know how that circuitry works in our own homes. We're not just putting together toys here, y'all. Here's a, a set of kids who were just beginning and starting to make their own. It's always, little bits is always so fun. They can start, kids can start really small with a, a five minute win to doing a huge cool stuff with Arduino and Wi-Fi and you really, really need to look up little bits. Other things that you might use inside that type of module. Again, feel free to pause and Google these. You're gonna fall in love teachers and students alike, you just learn so much. And if you can have a mentor come in who really knows electricity well, your kids will play, get hooked, and then that mentor can really push them with the great high-tech vocabulary and, and other challenges. I, I recommend that. The most popular module for for sure was the 3D modeling and printing. Kids want to print and I and I hooked them by letting them as they came in things were printing already. But you know I mean right? I show them the things being printed on the 3D printer but I didn't let them print anything until they had actually learned to build a model. They have to build before they get to print. And there are all sorts of different pieces of hardware that you can use with that. We love our MakerBot 3D printers. There's a whole variety. These are a little bit expensive. So if you're looking to, to get a big wow, there you are. Um, but I will say that it's just one small piece of, of a, a good maker space. Other things that you want to include with that are your, your model makers. Uh, Autodesk is really a great place to start. Very affordable, I think. Mm, free, right? Thingiverse is a library of things that people have, models that people have made. And you can just print straight from those, you print what other people have done, or you can uh, download theirs, edit it up, change it around, mod it, and then re-upload and print, or or upload your own original designs, which I want my kids to do. I don't want them to just steal other people's ideas and call it theirs. I want them to make their own, and so I like to get them started on SketchUp. It's got a, a very low uh, learning curve to it. Uh, there is some adjustment that to change the format of the files from SketchUp that goes over to the MakerBots, but it's doable. It's something that your kids really get hooked into. And... Uh, both the teachers and the students had a tough time really making something that in, in a two, three hour time period, two or three period time period. But again, in this level one, they were going to every module and testing it 
before then they were able to dive into their own choices in level two. Let's take a listen to what these girls had to say. So, I'm Lily, and I'm Lauren, and I was just, and we both, just at the uh, 3D printing center, and it was so weird because I finally got mine done, and then they're already printing mine, except it has to be smaller, because otherwise I wouldn't have enough time to make it. So then I was like, okay, well, what size should I get? And they're like, well, what about the smallest one? And I was like, well, what about the smallest one? And they're like, well, what about the smallest one? And I was like, well, what about the smallest one? And they're like, well, what about the Lauren may have deleted her doghouse. <laughs> she may have deleted her doghouse, but she was back in and building it again. Are you tired of having kids turn in halfway done projects or are only giving a half effort? What is it you're asking them to do? How are you hooking them in? Absolutely love these kiddos, right? So what you've seen is just the bare bones of basics so far. Each group got about, like I said, two to three hours at each module. It was a taste. It was a warm-up. It was, it was a lead-up to do this. This is what I'm really getting kids to do. This is level one learning in a full-time program, but in a camp of five days, this was our level two. I had to stretch the kids beyond just the oohs and ahs of, of, of doing a quick thing. But I needed to give them that quick thing so they could have a quick win. Because if I handed them this to begin with, the quality isn't as high. Again, I walk them up to more difficult things. I stretch them beyond. And in this process of leveling up, uh, the teachers get reminded of the purpose of education with this level two. Maybe that's not the purpose of schooling, but that's the purpose of education, is to do good things for the world. So what other possible modules can we put into a steam maker camp? It's, it's infinitely flexible. What else can we add that's cool, fun, that, that's learning? And again, high quality mentors will take the learning further. As a social studies teacher, I'm actually at an advantage in this STEM type of program because I don't know, and I don't even try to fake that I know. This is one of those that I, I rely on connecting with the community, and then the community sees what we're doing and begins to value it because they're an integral part. If I was a, if I was a science or a tech or a math teacher, I, I, might, I might think that I could do more and not need to rely on the community as much. Something to ponder. People always ask about the consumables and the hardware um, my, and the costs. I, 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 my biggest tip is, uh, first of all, go to Maker Shed. They've got a great list of stuff you probably want to have. Uh, of course, your modules will need to be specific, but then have some other stuff in general. Uh, biggest tip, buy inexpensive tools. Now, not the ones that are just going to break instantly, but not your top of the line because a lot of people want to deck out on top of the line. What happens is the kids use these and break them because they're still learning. I like to have one or two uh, top of the line pieces so that as they're learning, they can break the cheap ones. But if they really are good and have delved in, they've, they've earned the right to use the more professional level type of tools, whether it's a camera or if we go to a table saw, yes, a table saw. It, not everybody gets to go to that. You got to earn your earn your licks on the uh, on the hand saws and the hack hacksaws saws first. If you would like, go ahead and pause and read these right here because overall, this is why kids love not just Steam Maker Camp, but they they love all hands on learning by doing. That's what this is about. 
parents and administrators during the summer were actually Facebooking me and, and teachers have even stayed in contact with me over the, the duration of this year and, 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 and on, I'm sure. And they're, they're telling me about how they're remodeling and reviewing how they're approaching teaching and learning with their kids. See, the kids in this were just the props. Remember, this is about professional learning. I did this so that teachers could see how to redo their classroom. I can tell you about learning by doing and makerspace. It's not the same as being in there and being a learner. Remember, Steam Maker's about teachers learning. Kids are side benefit, right? If you're interested in this, you want to learn more about uh, doing uh, some maker education, maker space, steam maker camps for yourself. I, I do uh, I do own the steam maker camp brand, but you uh, probably listening to this video are probably part of the choir. You can dig in yourself. You can learn. Visit these websites. Uh, follow these hashtags on Twitter. Get connected with other teachers. There are a lot out there who are doing this. Develop your own and grow. You can. I, I did. It's the steam maker mentality, right? If this is what, something you're looking about, uh, thinking about doing, get yourself, get your team together and ponder these questions after you watch this presentation. Go further. What else do we need? If you have questions or you want to know more about me or Steam Maker Camp, let's get connected. I love to help teachers, leaders, schools, community rethink what education can really be. Thanks for listening.